Good afternoon. It is my singular pleasure to join you this afternoon. Oh, I guess I should stand here for a second. Um, singular pleasure to join you this afternoon and um, introduce our Grand Round Speaker of the Day. Um, Dr. Kathleen Carvero and I share a very important uh, issue. We're both passionate about the prevention of violence against children. And I will tell you in the work that she has done all over the world in more than three decades of work with the UN, with the Oak Foundation, her work has been characterized by a commitment to gender equity, a willingness to take on unpopular fights, a systems thinking approach to solving the unsolvable. So this afternoon, what she's going to talk about is something that's really critical, which is what is the intersection of communications, policy, politics, and strategy? And what is it that we need to know to join her in the fight in the prevention of violence against children? I think Kathleen, who has joined us recently after um, a tenure as the head, uh, as the president of the Oak Foundation, the Oak Foundation based in Geneva is one of the only foundations that has made the prevention of violence against children a top priority. They had the boldness of her vision and her voice to attack child sex abuse systematically across the globe. And so we at CUNY are incredibly fortunate to have recruited her to join us as one of the directors of the Center for Refugee, Global, and Migrant Health. Please join me in welcoming Kathleen to the stage. Thank you very much, Lyndon. And my topic this afternoon, as you can see, is ending violence against children, a public health imperative. Before I start, I want to acknowledge and introduce my two collaborators in this. I've had many years of working on this issue, but much of what I um, present today um, is the result of collaboration with two of CUNY SBH's own, Amanda Nace and Laura Ansley Hobbs. Amanda has um, 10 years experience as a public health professional. Five of those were in Namibia where she had firsthand experience working on violence against children surveys, which I will talk to you about. She has a domestic focus on infant and maternal mortality and HIV AIDS. She's a PhD candidate in the health policy and management uh, department. And she is the main author of the analysis of peer reviewed literature, which we will discuss today. Um, Laura Ansley Hobbs is a current MPH student at CUNY SPH in the Community Health and Social Sciences Department. And before coming to CUNY, she was a community health educator in Albania with the Peace Corps, focusing on women's reproductive um, health and rights. So Ansley and Amanda, um, I will be making the presentation, but they are available to help answer questions afterwards. So what did we want our four takeaway messages to be today? The first is that violence against children is a global health problem of epidemic proportions. The second is that there are evidence-based strategies to prevent this violence. The third is that data is available to guide prevention and the application of these strategies. And the fourth is that moving from data to action will achieve the goal which is ending all violence against all children everywhere. And I'm actually very aware that this room is full of epidemiologists and academic researchers and who will be clear that this is an impossible goal and there's all sorts of things wrong with it from an epidemiological point of view. Full disclosure, I am none of those things. I'm a public health practitioner and on this issue, I'm an advocate. So this is my goal and I'm sticking to it. And it's aspirational, I will admit, but it's impossible only because we choose to see it that way. So why aren't we making more progress? Because ending violence against children or violence against children as a problem is an inconvenient truth. It's a hidden in plain sight problem, which people don't want to talk about, particularly sexual violence. It never happens in my family or my community, and it's just something that doesn't get um, enough attention even when it's right in front of us. There's widespread fatalism about ending violence against children. It's just, it's been with us for millennia and there's really not anything to be done about it. It's a low income problem. It's really poverty that causes this and we have to 
we have to bring up all the whole levels of economic and social development before you can get at this problem. It's a cultural problem. It's in rooted in deeply rooted in cultural norms that we don't understand um, and that we shouldn't interfere with. It's a complicated problem. Um, we really don't know what to do anyway, even if we wanted to do something. Um, and it's somebody else's problem. You know, it's not my family, it's not my community, it's not my country. And specifically for this audience, I'll say there's a lot of it's not my sector. And the public health sector has not distinguished itself in this area at all. Um, I think Amanda just went to the um, American Public Health Conference where there was, I don't even say, I think there was one session at the whole conference on this. Um, and when I was working in the UN um, and with Oak Foundation, the health sector was one of the hardest sectors to get interested in this. This was for the social workers. This was for child protection people. This wasn't for the health sector. Um, and Linda has been telling me just before I started that the Surgeon General of the United States have never even issued a call to action on this problem. It's just an orphan problem, particularly um, within the health sector. So what do I need to convince you I need to convince you that violence against children is preventable. I need to convince you that there are evidence-based strategies that will prevent it. I need to convince you that there's data to guide application of these strategies. It's already available for many countries and it can be generated for others. And that when these strategies are applied, buoyed and relying on this data, violence will be eliminated. And I say this because it's true but also this is a really personal problem for me. And I'll just tell a story to um, make that clear. Um, in 1994, I got my dream job. I was made UNICEF representative in Uganda. And I was a very enthusiastic first time representative and it was a great time for Uganda. Um, although it was very troubled because HIV AIDS was ravaging the country and Uganda has always been about five to 10 years ahead of other countries when it came to HIV. But it was a great time because Museveni had just overthrown the second of the horrible dictators that were destroying Uganda. And Museveni was still seen as the possible second Nelson Mandela before he um, went a very different route. So politically in any other way, it was very positive. So I decided as the UNICEF representative, I was gonna visit every district in Uganda. And I started to do that. And early on in that tour, I was in a Western district. Um, and the Western part of Uganda was not the rich Southern part, but it wasn't the conflict affected Northern part either. So this was a fairly typical health center that I was visiting. And I saw a young girl, she was about 13 years old and she was about seven or eight months pregnant sitting in the corner of the health center. So like the enthusiastic UNICEF representative I was, I went over and I sat next to her and I asked her, what's your name? And she told me much more than her name. Her name was Fatime, but she had been raped by her uncle as a result of which she was HIV positive. When she told her family, she was kicked out of her family. When her pregnancy started to show, she was kicked out of school. Um, and she'd been living with kinder neighbors and in shelters and uh, basically didn't have a home. And she looked at me at that moment and she said, why is this happening to me? And I was her UNICEF representative and I had nothing to say to Fatima at that time. But of course, for me, I knew why it was happening because she had been failed by her family, by her school, by her community, by her country. And at that moment, by her UNICEF representative. So it's Fatime that I think about when I work on these issues and she grounds me and roots me to what's important. So I would just suggest that during the rest of this talk, think of a child you've seen in your work or think of a child that you love and that you would do anything to protect and put what I say in that context because you really have to appreciate this problem emotionally as well as understand it intellectually. So what are the types of violence that young children like Fatime are exposed to? Um, one is maltreatment. This includes all sorts of physical violence. 
It's mainly perpetrated by parents, caregivers, or other authority figures, and it affects children throughout their lives, but a lot of it happens for, to very young children. The second is bullying. Bullying happens often in community and school settings, and it's often perpetrated by other children. There's youth violence. Youth violence happens in community settings. It's gang violence, gun violence, um, and often this can be either by acquaintances or um, strangers, but it's a, it really is violence within the community affecting largely adolescents and, and principally adolescent boys. The fourth is intimate partner, partner violence. And I use this list because this is a WHO list, but I need to tell you I have a lot of trouble with intimate partner violence when you talk about children, because somehow as awful as intimate partner violence is, when you're referring to adults, you're referring to like a, a some kind of a choice of a partner who turned out to be the, a very wrong, bad partner. When you're talking about children, you're talking about primarily child marriage. So these are little girls who get brutalized and raped every day by somebody they had no idea know absolutely nothing to do with choosing as a partner. Um, so intimate partner violence is the polite term um, for child marriage. But I do keep it on the list because it's very clear that children are also affected by witnessing intimate partner violence in the um, situations in which they live. Sexual violence. This affects mostly girls, although we don't have good data on how it affects boys. Um, and this can be, um, you know, it happens in a variety of settings. It also includes trafficking and some online violence. But I'll just say here that we often have this idea that sexual violence, you know, we have this stranger danger myth that um, children suffer sexual violence because some sick or perverted strangers make their way into their bedroom or abduct them or find them in some place where they least expect it. The vast majority of sexual violence happens to children by people they know and should have been able to trust. Um, emotional or psychological violence. This happens to both boys and girls, often in home or school settings. And then of course there's structural violence, which is important um, and happens to children because they live in settings in which there's great gender inequality or discrimination um, or deprivation or adverse social norms. And these types of violence happen at different points in a child's life, but it's rare that a child just suffers one kind of violence. But for instance, maltreatment, as I said, would often happen early on. There's a lot of maltreatment that happens when children are very, very young. Um, the bullying is more preteen, um, and adolescent, um, the child marriage happens, can be in preteen and adolescent. Also, youth violence is usually adolescent boys and um, primarily older adolescent boys. Emotional and psychological violence um, goes throughout the life cycle. Um, I'll also add to this online violence. Now, bullying and, um, and sexual violence includes online exploitation. But I would suggest that online violence has taken on a, a life all its own. And if you follow the New York Times um, series of articles on online violence about the um, children who were exploited, uh, raped uh, on video when they were three and four, um, now they're 20 and they're trying to get on with their lives. And those images are still just repeating on the internet. Um, and by companies who have the wherewithal to take them down if they wanted to. So what are the numbers? There's a lot of, um, it varies depending on what you, um, depending on different reports, but it goes between 1 billion and 1.5 billion children in the world have experienced a form of violence in the last 12 months when we do surveys. So I'm using 1.2 billion, which is about in the middle. One in four children across the world experience some form of violence before they turn 18. One in four girls experience sexual violence, as do, according to our best estimates now, one in 13 boys. But as I said, we don't have a lot of, we don't have good data 
on boys. So violence varies across countries and regions. So homicides. Um, homicide um, is, the high, is the number one cause of death among adolescent boys in Latin America. Just blows your mind to think about that. Violent conflict, right now the region in which is the most dangerous for violent conflict um, is in the Middle East. School violence, corporal punishment rates are highest in Africa. Um, gun violence and uh, that, that kind of violence in schools is highest in the USA. Physical violence is across the globe and would more vary by um, vulnerability rather than country. So we know that um, there are uh, characteristics or that would make children vulnerable to physical violence wherever they live. That would be deprivation. So, um, you know, when families don't have enough uh, to go around, children living without their mothers, uh, children that experience or have to move from family to family, these children would be more vulnerable to physical violence um, regardless of where they live. So what are some of the impacts of this violence? The first is death. Death by knives, death by firearms, death by um, beating um, in, in, in the community violence I talked about. Again, boys make up 80% of both the victims and the perpetrators of the violence that results in death. Severe injuries also, a lot of that comes from the uh, youth violence that I spoke about. Brain and nervous system impairment. So this would be when you're exposed to violence at early ages, um, it affects, it has measurable effects on your nervous system, your endocrine and circulatory systems, your reproductive, respiratory and immune systems, just about everything. Um, it leads to also this kind of violence leads to negative coping and risk behaviors later on. So risky sexual behaviors, smoking, substance abuse, unintended pregnancies uh, like Fatime. Uh, so gyne gynecological problems. A lot of girls get pregnant way before they're ready, their bodies are ready to um, deliver a child. Sexually transmitted infections, HIV. Um, mental health issues. Um, and I read a Lancet article just saying that there is so much anecdotal evidence connecting depression, eating disorders, uh, suicide um, rates with sexual childhood abuse and sexual abuse. Um, and not enough, we haven't done enough very specific evidence on it. Non-communicable diseases later in life, cardiovas cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, a lot of these diseases are caused by the negative coping behaviors and risk behaviors that victims of sexual violence um, took up earlier on, and then reduced opportunities, just loss of self-esteem, fear, um, all the, um, the psychological things that victims of uh, child abuse feel that would cause them not to take full advantage of education or livelihood or job opportunities later on. So this graph maybe is clearer. This was done by the CDC and USAID and WHO on uh, children and adverse um, children with adverse childhood experiences, um, and it just shows um, all the different in much more detail all the different impacts that experience violence can have on children. So I hope that we've accomplished takeaway message number one, which is violence against children is a public health imperative. Ending violence against children is a public health imperative. Takeaway message number two is there are evidence-based strategies to prevent this violence. Um, and we have something called INSPIRE, which is a set of seven strategies that, take, that are built on the best available evidence with the, for strategies that have the greatest potential to reduce violence against children. This might not seem looking at it like this is so earth shattering, but certainly when I was UNICEF representative in Uganda and even up to about eight years ago, we didn't have a set of agreed strategies. UNICEF had five things everyone should do. CDC had a list of eight things everyone should do. WHO had a list of seven things 
uh, that would reduce violence against children. And they were similar, but they were just different enough to feed what I talked about earlier, which is this is a very complicated problem and we really don't know what to do. Um, the point is that we have Inspire, we have these seven strategies, and we very much do know what to do. And I just want to spend a couple of um, minutes talking about what these strategies are. First is laws. So this would include laws banning uh, corporal punishment, criminalizing sexual abuse, preventing alcohol misuse, limiting access to weapons. Those laws, if they're robustly written and strictly enforced, work to reduce violence against children. Um, norms, we have to address restrictive gender norms, um, build in bystander interventions, get people to react, build a community-wide zero tolerance. Widespread zero tolerance for child uh, against violence against children works to reduce the violence. Environments, including looking at the built environment, so this would include things like, where does the bus stop? Are there lights in public places? Are there safe ways for kids to get to school? Are there water points near where children live? Um, these kinds of interventions will also greatly reduce violence. Parents and caregivers, including home visits, um, commute, working with community groups, including mothers and fathers in parenting programs. I know that as when I was working with UNICEF, I imposed a lot of parenting programs on a lot of communities. And looking back, almost all of them were, were pretty much exclusively focused on the mother. And what we now know is that you bring in the father or focus on the father, parenting programs can be game changers. Um, income, cash, cash transfers, microcredit programs that include gender equity measures. Response and support. So while we're eliminating all violence against all children everywhere, there will be incidences of violence against children. And it's extremely important that there be effective and readily available and affordable um, counseling, screening, referral to interventions, treatment programs for juvenile offenders, because children make up a large group of perpetrators of violence against other children. And there's a lot that could be done to turn that around um, before it becomes a lifelong um, habit. Also, good, reliable, safe foster care can be very important response and support. Education, by increasing enrollment, increasing children's knowledge, life and social skills. When I was a um, when I was working at Oak Foundation, we funded some amazing programs in Latvia and Romania about teaching very young children what was appropriate or not in terms of being touched or being talked to by a stranger. And I'll never forget the amazing intervention that was done in Latvia, talking to kids about secrets and what's a good secret, what's a secret that you can keep and what's a secret you should never keep that there are some secrets that no one should ask you to keep a secret. And it was just, and they did, um, you know, some pretty rigorous evaluation methods. And it was amazing to see at what a young age children could be, start to be taught about their boundaries and what could they could expect. So takeaway message number three. Well, if we have all these strategies, do they all have to be implemented everywhere or do we have any way to know which strategy would be more um, powerful or effective in a given situation? And the answer to that is we do. And they are violence against children surveys and they provide a basis for applying the INSPIRE strategies. Violence against children surveys are nationally representative surveys of all children in a country between 13 to 24. Um, well, representative survey of children between 13 and 24 in a country. And it measures the burden of sexual, physical, and emotional abuse experienced in childhood and adolescence. There have been lots of surveys before this, and some of you may be familiar with those, but they all focus on one form of abuse or one setting or one kind of perpetrator. And violence against children surveys are unique in looking at all types of violence across 
all children in all settings by all perpetrators. So they actually provide a very robust body of data at a national level about where, what the problems are, um, and then, and therefore guide the implication, the application of the strategies. So, um, the experience to date. We've done violence against children surveys in 22 countries, 14 in Africa, three in Asia, five in Latin America, one in Europe. Um, they have provided unprecedented amounts of data, galvanized strong partnerships among US government organizations, as well as between the US government and multilaterals and civil society groups, and they have guided the use of INSPIRE. And this just gives you an idea, it's just a map um, where you can see where VACs have been completed is the pink, um, where the reports have actually come and where they're in progress. There's one more Violence Against Children survey that will get underway in the spring and that's in Ethiopia, which is important because it's a very large child population. So what do the VACs tell us? Um, Amanda and Ansley and I and Diana Rivera and Jim all work for a project called the Health Evaluation and Applied Research Development Project or the HERD project. Jim is the director of HERD and it works on various projects um, and various implementation science um, challenges with USAID and one of these is related to violence against children surveys. Um, and USAID has asked HERD to help the partners who have developed violence against children surveys understand how VACs are implemented in countries, how the data that VACs generate have been, um, how, how, what data have they generated and how is it being used, um, is INSPIRE guiding the application um, of, the, of the data and the um, formulation of plans as a result. Um, what resources and support are available to the VACs and how can we promote learning to improve the VACs as we move forward. So the first step was to mine the data from the peer-reviewed articles. What we found is the first VAC was done in 2009, so they've been going on for 10 years. And over those 10 years, 37 peer-reviewed articles have been done looking at these results. And Amanda has spent a lot of time and energy really mining the data from these articles. Now, it might not seem, some of you might work in areas of public health, you're like 37, big deal. But, um, well, 10 years ago, if you Googled violence against children, you'd be hard pressed to come up with one peer reviewed article. Um, the fact that there's 37 from my vantage point and an advocate for this issue is a library of data on this compared to what we had and hopefully the VAX um, can generate more. So there's 37 articles, they span four geographic regions, um, 22 focus on one country, 15 focus on two and more and three countries um, and and three countries are cited more than others. Those are Kenya, Malawi, and Tanzania. But a great number of countries are actually cited in these peer-reviewed articles. So what we did was just take out three different areas to just give you a taste of what these violence against children surveys can tell us about what's going on in a country. So first we did it by peer-reviewed articles by gender. So what you can see here is that Almost all the articles cover both girls and boys, but a number of them really focus on girls. Only two of these peer reviewed articles zero in on boys. One of these looks at sexual violence, um, the prevalence of sexual violence among boys. Um, the other looks at boys as perpetrators. So actually only one in the 37 looks at boys as victims um, of violence and in this case sexual violence. And we know that sexual violence, um, the, the levels of sexual violence against boys are quite high. In fact, in Indonesia and Cambodia, um, studies among these studies have shown us that it's actually higher, levels of sexual violence are actually higher among boys um, than girls. Um, what we, this, these studies have also um, confirmed what we knew, which was that experience violence 
against children, experiencing violence as a child makes you more. And overall, there's no difference in the experience of violence across boys and girls. So we have this, and the reason there's difference in the kind of violence that um, boys and girls experience, but it was interesting to find um, that these VACs are telling us over and over again that overall the levels, levels of violence are the same. So for instance, you would have higher levels of sexual violence among girls, but corporal punishment in schools is higher among boys. So in the end, it unfortunately evens out um, and both boys and girls suffer. The next um, just tidbit we'll take out of these articles is peer reviewed articles by the type of violence. So um, 14 studies focused on sexual violence, um, which is not surprising because PEPFAR, which is the big government program that um, looks, uh, that is designed to address HIV in countries, has been the big funder of violence against children uh, surveys. And one of the reasons they are a big funder is on the hypothesis that being a victim of violence makes you more vulnerable to HIV for a number of reasons. And this is absolutely borne out, um, but it's probably also a reason why sexual violence gets a lot of uh, attention. Um, absolutely, these studies show that there's an ex exposure to sexual violence is highly correlated with higher risk behaviors and in particular HIV risk behaviors. It also indicates that the use of interviews, these violence against children surveys are done by interviewers going to households randomly um, across countries. So it's all done by, you know, a face to face interview with someone. And what we've um, found out is that the very fact that you're using an interview and someone has to say that they've experienced sexual violence out loud to another person can sometimes reduce the levels of sexual violence that will be disclosed as part of the surveys. And one of the, um, an example of why we know that is that in Laos, they did the violence against children survey through the interviews, and then they did an anonymous instrument afterwards, and the level of sexual violence reported went up when it was anonymous as opposed to the interviews. Um, we also know from um, these peer reviewed articles that there is a dose response relationship between the types and level of violence a child experiences um, and the odds of perpetration later on. Um, which is why only, um, I think only two of the 37 studies look at poly victimization. So in other words, many of them look at more than one type of violence, but only two look at if a child experiences physical, sexual, and emotional violence, are the impacts on that child different or worse than if they experienced a lot of one type of violence? Or um, so, and we found that absolutely that's the case. So it would suggest that maybe we should do a little bit more work on looking at the impacts of poly victimization. Only two studies looked at emotional violence specifically as well. But those two studies showed a significantly higher correlation between emotional violence and suicide ideation than other types of violence. So it also suggests that maybe we should be looking uh, a bit more at emotional violence on its own as well as um, in conjunction with other types of violence. And just interestingly um, for the women's rights um, activists in the room, something that's not terribly um, Surprising, in Nigeria, they actually found that levels of violence against children were higher in communities where women had higher employment rates, which shows the backlash effect that we sometimes see. And the third point um, we'll just raise is on the peer reviewed articles by first author affiliation. Um, Cause this is dramatic. And I think in a public health school, it's important to point out um, of the 37 articles, only one of the 37 was done, um, was issued by an institution, a wholly national institution based in a country um, that had actually done a violence against children survey. The vast majority of studies were done by the CDC, others by uh, international organizations or Northern authors. 
um, and we'll say a little bit more about that. We did see that four of the studies were done by uh, fellows working for the CDC, which suggested to us that this is something that maybe fellows in other countries um, might be able to um, be trained to do. So what are our observations from this peer-reviewed literature? Boys are understudied. We could learn more from the VAX about boys. There are significant differences in the types of violence studied. The focus is on sexual violence. We maybe should look more at poly victimization, more at emotional violence and the impacts um, that that has on children. There are limitations on cross-country comparisons. And this is basically because there needs to be a constant balance between um, standardization of these surveys because the CDC has designed these surveys and is the main technical support for all countries doing violence against children surveys. And the CDC has a very strong and justifiable interest in having these violence against children surveys, having them be comparable across countries. But what we know with an issue like violence and other sensitive issues is it's very context specific. So if you wanna get the answer to a question in one context, you might have to ask a very different question to get at that same issue in another context. So everywhere that a violence against children study has been done, there has had to be a balance between standardization and adaptation. And this has made cross country comparisons, um, they just have limitations and you have to uh, qualify a lot what you're saying across countries. Um, we've also found, as I pointed out, limited range of authors and in institutions, maybe suggesting that the violence against children surveys are still seen as something that is done to a country rather than done by a country. Um, that's something we need to look at moving forward. Um, measurement and design issues, and uh, some of you might be interested in those, and Amanda can speak to those afterwards, but selection bias, recall bias, confounding, obviously in any kind of survey like this, there are gonna be um, issues like that. Um, and also that there are significant policy and program shifts that the violence against, survey, violence against children surveys have generated beyond national programs of action. And that's important, and I just wanna take a minute to say that these violence against children surveys, to be honest, were, as I said, designed by um, the CDC. Um, they are, uh, their implementation is supported by UNICEF, WHO, um, and a number of uh, Northern uh, INGOs. And when the violence against children survey methodology was developed, a fairly linear process was imagined. You would develop a survey with technical support from the CDC. Then you would implement that survey with trainers that were uh, supported and trained by the CDC. Then the CDC would either crunch the numbers itself or crunch numbers in conjunction with some nationals. Um, then you would have a data, to, then you would have a, a workshop in the country where you would look at the results of the Violence Against Children survey. Um, you would develop a plan based on that results. You would implement the plan with resources, um, mostly from external sources. Um, and then hopefully you're on the road to reducing violence against children uh, in your setting. What we have found, and Ansley's done a lot of work looking at all these different processes, is that it doesn't seem to be working that way. There are six national plans, and there may be more because there are still um, some surveys in progress. But sometimes these national plans were preceded by data action workshops. Sometimes they weren't. Um, it just, there was, it wasn't along that linear process. Um, also, sometimes data to action surveys generated other things. They didn't generate a national plan. Um, we found that there was a increased investments in inspire related strategies in Malawi, an adoption of a children's policy in Swaziland. So there wasn't a national plan per se, but a very robust children's policy resulted. Um, a number of programs that gave heightened attention to adolescents in Zimbabwe um, and Tanzania. And I have to um, also just on this note, when we did the, um, the VAC in Tanzania, um, we actually found when we were designing the survey um, that there was no word in Swahili 
that corresponded to the word adolescent in English. So actually the concept was that you went from child to adult. Um, it was just very, so one of the things in Tanzania has been the whole um, concept that there's this in between time that's special and requires special interventions. So that's just some of the things that we never imagined would come from the VAX, but it's been very important. Um, and then there's been national adaptations of violence against children surveys, including, for instance, in the Philippines. So what are the next steps? As heard, we would like to enrich this peer reviewed, um, this analysis of peer reviewed literature with surveys in every country, which Diana has um, helped Ansley to develop, um, where we would actually, we would talk, we would get information from key people working on VAX in different countries. The idea would be to, what has worked? What was hard? What were the challenges? What remains to be done? You developed a national plan of action. Did it ever get any money? When you developed your national plan of action, was there a multi-sectoral committee that helped develop it? Um, what's the status of implementation now? We want to understand better what is facilitating um, robust VAX and the development of national plans and what might be hindering them. Um, and Diana and Ansley have also developed a key informant uh, interview guide. So we'll supplement the survey with discussions with the key people in every country, try to triangulate what the literature is telling us, um, what the surveys tell us, what the interviews tell us, so we can really understand more about uh, the process through Violence Against Children surveys can continue and get stronger and more effective in the future. Secondly, we want to drill down in a couple of countries. So work with um, one or two or three countries that are experiencing very specific challenges and get on the ground with them, identify technical partners that can help them, hopefully that are already in the country, not necessarily uh, partners from the United States or Europe, that can help them identify the challenges and work them through, which we can learn and disseminate what we've learned um, so that other VACs uh, can be stronger and national plans can be better implemented. We also want to get more VACs funded because right now we only have Ethiopia on the books. PEPFAR is getting a little less enthusiastic about funding VACs. They've kind of done the VACs in all the countries where it's important to them. Um, they do cost anywhere between 1 million and 3 million depending on how big the country is and how ambitious the project is. So um, they're not cheap. So let's recap. We know the scale of the problem. We know its devastating impacts. We know what works. We know how to generate national data. We know that ending violence against children appears in eight of the sustainable development goal targets so that countries will actually have to monitor and report on progress in reducing violence against children in the future. And we know that sufficient political will, resources and public outreach Public, public outrage can achieve the goal. So I was tempted to add, to end with the Nike um, motto of just do it, but I decided to be more elegant and end with Nelson Mandela, who famously said that action without vision is passing time, vision without action is daydreaming, but vision with action can change the world. So I hope that I've convinced you that we have the vision and we know what the action is and that we can actually change the world for children. And I hope to have convinced you that history will not be kind to those who knew the scale of the problem, had the technical and financial resources to do something and just decided not to. Thank you. <laughs> One of the areas that perhaps was not uh, contextualized in this talk is uh, approaches to child rearing mm -hmm. that include physical discipline. Um, and I would say that it is pervasive globally 
still mm -hmm. uh, and requires a transformation in the culture, the expectations, and parenting behaviors and parenting perspectives. Need I say it is even in developed and rich countries mm -hmm. that children are continue to be subjected to unreasonable and unnecessary violence that way. Uh, what is your concept there? And uh, mm -hmm. I, I hate I hate to uh, to um, link violence against children necessarily to poverty because we do see it in rich countries as well. Mm -hmm. Right. I would say, um, yes, it's absolutely not a poverty-based problem. Um, maltreatment of children, including physical violence, I would say physical violence, not sexual violence, not emotional violence, um, but physical violence, there is, I would say that extreme deprivation um, is a, a risk factor for physical violence against children. So um, you, poverty comes in there, but um, we've seen inc very high levels of effectiveness of parenting programs, particularly parenting programs, as I mentioned, that focus on fathers. Um, because there are, um, it, it's in some African countries in particular, when fathers are given permission <coughs> to have a different kind of relationship with their children, they embrace it. Um, but what's holding it back, and again, this is one of these things where you can't just do one, um, necessarily one intervention, but even if a father knows how to relate differently to a child or wants to try, um, if he feels that that's going to be, that's going to cause him to be an object of ridicule um, or to lose respect in a the community, then obviously that's going to be a hindrance. But um, it's, there, there's a good amount, there, I mean, there's increasing evidence that we can change those. If, if parents are given um, different alternatives and they understand the impact of what the, of what physical violence has on children that they will change. But I'm not, I wouldn't say that, as I said, extreme deprivation and structural violence um, has a relate, there's a relationship with physical violence in every country. But that's the key, not just, you know, it's all relative, but we see that in the United States as well. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you and the field see as the similarities and differences between uh, the interpersonal types of violence you've talked about and political violence and war against children. And what are the uh, advantages and disadvantages of thinking of those two big burdens on children's well-being as a phenomenon that can be addressed together in a separate phenomenon? Um, I mean, there's definite relationships between, um, in countries that have experienced violence over a prolonged period of time, um, or experienced conflict over a prolonged period of time, violence can become normalized. So it's very hard, um, people's um, tolerance for violence or what is acceptable or not acceptable can become, um, it, it can change over time. So absolutely there's a connection there. Um, and that's why there's very specific interventions um, that need to be put in place quickly and early in conflict um, affected societies to stop that from happening. Um, but usually in a, at least in the beginning of a conflict um, affected situation, it will exacerbate um, adverse social norms um, and some negative behaviors that were already in a society. So it's not that, um, you know, uh, you see different manifestations of the kind of violence that occurs um, in conflict affected countries. Um, based on what was there even before the conflict started. So what I would say is there's a definite relationship, um, but one of the fat, one of the 
impacts of conflict is just to exasper, exacerbate what was already there and to normalize conflict across situations. I saw that in Uganda um, very clearly. Are there any practices that can, can help the children who, this vast number of people who are living long term in refugee situations, like <coughs> in camps where that kind of violence is so endemic? Is there anything that can be done in those settings? There's enormous amount that can be done in those settings. Everything from the banal to the sophisticated lights, you know, can lights can do an enormous amount um, to keep children safer. Um, where the water points are, um, getting kids in a school situation, however rustic it might be at the beginning, um, you know, all those things. There's a, there's a whole raft of things that can be done, even in the worst of situations, that can be protective. Keeping families together, something there are countries in the world that really need to think about that. But yes, keeping families together is very protective um, against, you know, in a, um, in a conflict or a migrant or a movement situation. You mentioned addressing this globally and across and the prevalence being significantly greater in, in different areas of the world. And I've, this is something that's of interest to me as well. Can you hear me now? <laughs> and um, I'm just curious about whether or not some of the hesitation might be formulating interventions that don't pit cultures against each other. And this is something that even in thinking about it on my own, like how, how would you do that without saying, without pointing fingers, so to speak, and saying it's because of this cultural norm that is sort of exacerbating the issue in this part, part of the world? how you wouldn't pit one country against each other. Yeah, so for example, on the, the top of your list was Latin America and the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And so um, some of the, a lot of the studies that I've looked at have originated from these sorts of cultures and mm -hmm. addressing why violence within cultures might be perceived as normal. And sometimes studying those sorts of things um, within a certain culture makes it seem as though there's something innate about that culture mm -hmm. and about the people of that culture that that you know make this as prevalent as it is and i wonder is there a way or is this part of the hesitation in addressing this globally um i think it's part of the excuse not to develop not to address it globally um but there are there are many ways um to understand what's driving violence against children and to take action against it without going on a cultural rampage. Um, and you don't even have to go there. I mean, in most situations you can look at, um, you know, you could look at the built environment or uh, what's happening in schools or, um, you know, there's, there are many measures you can take while you're raising the awareness so that communities themselves will start to think about um, what's happening and what's, what's considered normal in their community that might be very um, harmful to children. Um, you know, and then there are things like female genital mutilation that I just think need to be called out at every level. Um, but that's, you know, that goes across a number of cultures. But absolutely what you're pointing to is, a, you know, it's, it's an, a very important factor to avoid. I have a question that maybe I should know the answer to, but I just wonder, can you talk a little bit about the um, selection of the 22 countries that are, have participated in VACs? Like for example, CDC is a big, um, a lead you know, agency in it and the US is not a US VACs, right? And other countries, did I don't know that, I know how that or the, that you spoke. How were the countries chosen? Yeah. Um, and pretty clearly, the countries were chosen um, uh, 
at least in the beginning, and the African countries were chosen because PEPFAR was making large investments in reducing HIV in those countries. And as I said, the hypothesis was that in particular, high rates of violence against girls was making, makes them more vulnerable to HIV. Therefore, it was important to find out what was driving that violence and to try to reduce that violence or whatever other interventions you were putting in place to, to um, address HIV were not going to be as um, effective. So almost all the countries in Africa, which are most of the countries that have done VAX, um, were chosen that way. Um, and there's criticism of the VAX because of that saying that, um, well, maybe that's why, I mean, I've heard criticism, well, maybe that's why there, there seems to be um, slow national take up of the results. Um, again, because these VACs were done to a country rather than, um, I, you know, I, I think there were a couple of Asian countries, but I, in, certainly in the beginning, countries weren't raising their hand and saying, please, we want to know um, what the levels of violence against children are in our country. Could you please come here and do it? Um, that said, I think there are an, a number of African countries that have, have been incredibly courageous and, and forthright about what they've done with the results. But um, as, I, as I tried to talk about um, when I discussed the process, this has been a pretty <coughs> northern driven. Um, the VAX, are, I think it's fair to say, have been um, pretty external aid driven. Um, I, there's been very little national funding that's gone to VAC so far, although there is in the development of the national plans and to some extent in the implementation of the plans. Thank you. 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 Th
Um, but uh, but I think to your point, it's I, it's really important not national and global level that there be champions and that people will. Um, now we hope. So there was two parts of your question. One was the champion, um, but implicit in your question was, are we going to have a proof of concept soon? You know, did the survey, got the results, developed the plan, implemented the plan, and then can show a reduction in violence. Um, I would say for that to happen, um, we're a few years out from that happening. Um, we might see that in Uganda. Um, I think we might see it in Cambodia. Um, so there's a few countries that are on their way to be proof of concept countries. Um, but we don't have them yet. That's why, as you know, um, the herd project is not an evaluation of VAX. We're not evaluating the VAX and saying, wait a minute, uh, violence against children has not gone down. These are no good. It's way too early to do that. Um, we're looking at the process at this point. Hi. Um, am I on? I guess I just want to start by thanking you so much. We got to talk a little bit at the beginning. And I come from child welfare where this is the work. And I've been, in my time here at CUNY, have been so struck at the absence of kind of recognition of this issue within public health. Um, and the I would say in, in the US, I'm certainly not as familiar at all with internationally, but in the US, I think in the health sector, I would say that the people who are moving this forward, um, if anyone is, is pediatricians. And to your question, um, I mean, the American Academy of Pediatrics, for example, put out a statement last year around corporal punishment. Um, and I think people feel like, well, parents trust their pediatricians. And so those are really good kind of, um, you know, uh, transmitters of that sort of information in, in a less judgmental way um, and certainly a less scary way than child protection, for example. But I'm, I guess I'm curious as to now being here at a school of public health, what your thoughts are about getting this more on the public health, like academic public health agenda, um, not simply in a refugee context or whatnot, but just like having it be um, a thing that is kind of part of this, like the I don't even know what you would call it, but the the kind of um, the basics that is covered in any sort of public health 101 class. This is so such a ubiquitous issue for people across the world, but we don't talk about it as a public health issue. So I'm just curious, kind of from that perspective, what your thoughts are. Um, yeah, I mean, I have to say I was surprised to be asked to give this talk. So there's somebody at CUNY <laughs> thinking that this is an important public health issue. So I think that's a good sign. Um, yeah, I, I think it really needs to be um, integrated and, and looked at from a, a public health perspective. Um, and as you say, it hasn't been so far. Um, and, I, and it's great news about the pediatricians. I mean, we've really had a, a rough time when we've tried to get um, health professional. You know, they said, we're like, we got enough on our plate and um, we'll refer it silently to social services if we think we see it, but that's about as much as we're going to do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think when you, when um, schools of public health that have um, policy tracks and community health tracks, um, this is really important to be thinking about because it has enormous costs socially, financially, every other way to communities. Um, but I would say, uh, I just want to add the implementation science that HERD really focuses on implementation science. And I know that one of the, um, one of the goals of HERD um, is to try to get this to be on the agenda of implement, implement, implementation science fora, which it's completely missing from. So I don't know, maybe we'll make progress in the end. Anthony, maybe I'll ask the last question. One of the areas where detection of uh, violence against children is is very plausible and possible is in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And the training of teachers in detection of signs of violence against children mm -hmm. and how it manifests in the child uh, 
has, uh, has become uh, more commonplace in the United States in, in training teachers. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, wanting to hear from your perspective, is that happening in some of these other countries where some of these studies have happened? Yes, I would say a big emphasis in this field is to flip teachers from being seen as potential perpetrators to um, uh, people who will actually, you know, bring it forward. And in some settings, most of the detection is coming from teachers. Unfortunately, in other settings, um, most of the perpetration um, in schools is being done by teachers. And in, in some settings, there's um, really high levels of sex for grades and uh, sex for lunch and sex, you know, it's, um, it's quite a serious problem, but in certainly in all part of Inspire, there not only there aren't those seven, there not only those seven strategies, but a um, couple hundred pages of guidelines for each of the strategy. And in education, um, getting teachers to be allies um, is really an important emphasis. That's a very good point. Thank you very much. Thank you.